Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to Manchester. Welcome to the University of Manchester. My name's Fiona Saunders. I'm a lecturer here in project management. So you may, you may see around the room, those of you from the APM, there are a number of students here as well from the university that we were able to invite to this event. So um, thank you to the APM for allowing us to do that. Um, apologies for those of you who um, were over at the Pariser building and were kind of a bit lost. One of the things the university has not yet managed to get right is its room booking system. So there's been a bit of a mix up there. Hopefully everyone that wants to be here has made it here. Um, so without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our speaker this evening, who's Steve Rifkin from... Oh. Kando. Kando UK. Who's, um, a programme manager from Akando UK, which is a big, well, I don't know you, how big you are, but uh, a, a programme and project management company. There's a bit of consultancy, a bit of programme and project management um, based in the North West, but I think a, a Swedish company, aren't yes, you? Yeah, we have, um, we have three offices. Right, OK. So Steve is going give to give us a talk this evening <coughs> on managing complex, uh, complex projects. And um, you're going to talk for about an hour, I think, aren't you? And there'll be the opportunity for questions at the end. Okay, but I guess if there's some burning question, sure. then you're probably okay to interrupt too. So, um, and then we'll have a wrap-up session at the end. So, thank you all for coming, and uh, hand over to Steve. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, all. Thanks for coming. Um, the topic of the talk this evening is uh, managing large complex development projects and um, because the audience is a mix of postgraduate students and experienced project and program management managers um, I'm trying to walk a tightrope to pitch this at the right level for all of you so I hope you bear with me um, to, I had two options I could have concentrated on one particular aspect and go into it in a great deal of depth or I could actually go across quite a wide range of topics covering the whole life cycle and so on at a higher level um, I've chosen to do the latter I've chosen to do a fairly uh, wide in scope presentation so that it's at a fairly high level covers a lot of topics um, at that level rather than concentrate in depth in one particular aspect okay so you can see there are quite a number of areas I'm going into um, some typical problems a little bit about requirements management in general um, a particular style of requirements management requirements driven design and then some supporting processes to, to actually support the whole of the uh, requires management and project life cycle um, then I'm going on to consider specific types of requirement um, uh, when you're integrating the processes and looking at um, different pots of requirements like legal requirements environmental requirements those sorts of things and um, then going through into operational rollout um, looking at the commercial uh, sorry the operational maintenance and systems disposal requirements um, if there's time I'll show an example of graphical navigation around the processes um, then I'm going to speak um, just for a short time on conformance to international standards how you actually merge in those requirements into the main uh, flow of system requirements a um, little bit about safety case and profiling requirements that are specific to certain industry sector sectors like um, pharmaceuticals, rail, nuclear and so on a um, little bit about managing multiple contractors and then uh, some government's information and so on so that you can see it's fairly wide range but I'll be covering them at a fair speed um, we will be making this presentation available to you so I shouldn't worry too much about taking notes it's the principles that are important um, the intention is to um, allow you to get a copy with notes of the presentation and then we're also videoing it so hopefully you'll be able to, to uh, see the whole presentation again if it's of interest to you yeah. so we're looking at some common problems um, 
one of the key problems that you find, even on very, very large developments, is that the stakeholder requirements uh, and the client's requirements tend to quite often to be inad inadequately defined. They could be really little more than a wish list. Um, quite often they're not well structured, um, they're not formal. Um, they sort of convey the overall wishes of the client and the main stakeholders, but they're not necessarily rigorously defined. So, um, so what tends to happen is that um, contractors who've worked in these large, on these large projects before, um, could be a large rail project, um, pharmaceutical problem project, whatever, it could be subcontracted aspects of that, um, they sometimes don't, uh, they, they think they've done it all before and they know what's required. They look at the stakeholder requirements and they say, yeah, we've done this before, um, we'll go off and design you a system or part of a system and no problem. Um, even if they do get some more detailed requirements flowing down from the stakeholders requirements to form more formal system requirements, most often they don't provide any linkage back to the stakeholder requirements um, and to their ultimate designs. So the problem you've got is that you can't prove that you've actually done what the stakeholders want unless you have an auditable traceable path back to those requirements. You can never say for sure you've met the requirements. Um, so let's just uh, what tends to happen later in, later in the project life cycle is that the legal team become involved and they, they basically typically advise the client not to let the main works contracts out, you know, because you have the, the business plan, you have your stakeholders' requirements, and then ultimately you get to the phase in the project life cycle where you want to get um, the main contractors involved and you want to go out to tender, you want to award contracts. So it used to be that um, designs were done, early designs were done by the client's project team and those designs were made available to contractors. The problem with that is that legally, if a, if a contractor and their subcontractors work to that design, they adopt that design, and for whatever reason it doesn't work, they, they could always claim um, legally that they've only done what they were asked to do. So the advice from the lawyers is to only award contracts against well specified sets of requirements. But even if that happens, Typically, they don't, they're not linked, um, so that you don't have this audible traceability. Um, and what, long term, what happens is when the, the main contractor's designs are finished in more detail, the client gets his specialist um, consultants to have a look at the designs. It may take six, eight months to consider the designs, and then they'll, they'll turn around and say, well, that's not what I wanted. Um, if it's a rail project, the radius of this, this curve is too tight, it's going to create too much noise, that's not acceptable because we've, we've, we've given guarantees that we'll keep the noise limits down and so on. So the client's not happy, the contractors aren't happy because they have to get some of the key members of the team back together who by that time are probably on other projects. So it's a highly unsatisfactory situation. So just standing back a little bit, my, this is my sort of take on what project management is about. Um, it's about answering the three um, fundamental questions. What do you want? How are you going to do it? And how are you going to prove you said what you've, you, you said you were going to do? You've done what you, you were going to do. Um, you said you were going to do. The, the what's, what do you want? They're essentially the requirements. How are you going to do it? Well, the how is about the design and the proof is in the verification, so you need something which actually addresses those three questions. So you need to be able to specify um, a means of capturing requirements, allow for the specification of the design and provide verification me me mechanisms so you can actually show how you've linked the design to the requirements 
and put the arguments in there that say why you've done what you, you've done. So that ultimately um, you can trace that back to the stakeholders' requirements and give the verification. Um, one thing you don't want to do is change the way people design. Um, my experience on, uh, I've worked on in the past on a number of large rail projects, um, East London Line, Crossrail, um, Nottingham Express Transit and various other ones. Um, what surprised me is that um, the project team members are specialists in their own right. That you get multidisciplinary teams of civil engineers, mechanical engineers, communications engineers and so on. They're all experts in what they do. They're, they're typically world-class experts. They don't know anything about project management. So they've never heard of a project life cycle, VMOBL, even though they've been working on projects for many, many years. So um, you don't want to be telling them to design in a different way. You want to accommodate their specialist design methods within whatever structure you actually um, think up. So initially, if we've decided we need to, um, requirements are important, they're important legally, we need to define what it is we're going to do. We need to actually decide what um, type of approach for requirements capture we're going to use. So in general, um, we've actually um, basically got a four-step process regardless of the type of um, requirements. Even if you're going to um, do a software development, um, a large um, construction project, whatever, you've got to gather requirements, analyse them, make sure they're genuine requirements as opposed to a wish list and establish a baseline before you actually um, do your design. Um, depending on which sector you're working in, you can uh, have different approaches. Uh, you may be doing uh, an agile approach in software development or that would be different to a typical waterfall approach. Um, or you may, be you, know, you may be doing a business transformation, but those sorts of requirements will be different to the way you manage construction requirements. So you've got to get the right horse for the right course. Um, one thing which is essential in a large project uh, is to actually, before you actually start the requirements management, is to actually get the senior management buy-in backed up with a budget. Um, you have to have in post a requirements manager who should create a requirements management plan with a strategy and showing how they can actually address the three questions, what, how, and prove it. Um, and then the plan should decide if it's a multidisciplinary team, typically if it's a large construction type project, um, may, may cover quite a large <coughs> geography. So what should you do? Should you send specialist teams in which go to across the geography, so you might have um, a tunnel team in one area and a different team in another area and their approach is slightly different or should you send the same team across the, se uh, across the different geography using the same generic approach um, I would say the latter uh, my experience is that you want to it's more efficient to actually use a generic approach where possible um, whether it's communications, building tunnels, building bridges, whatever it's better to move the same team across a geography rather than have different teams with different approaches. Um, and basically, once you've got your plan and your strategy together, um, the actual activities in that plan that are called for, the, the various type of activities, should be captured in the project schedule. Um, so you have periods of time where somebody's doing the requirement solicitation, analysis, conducting reviews, and so on. You need to make sure that you allocate time and don't, it's not considered as a bureaucratic add-on. It's actually taken seriously with budget and it's properly in the schedule. So typically, um, you tend to get more requirements as you go down. So you've got your stakeholder requirements, you may have your programme requirements, which are obviously in number more than the stakeholder requirements because you're, you're starting off with little known about how you're going to do things and you, you actually progressively do a top-down refinement of the requirements. So at this level, there are far more than at that level. But 
any, anything you actually do has to take r the real world into consideration. So although you can actually get from there down to there primarily with a, um, a logical consideration of the pro pro problems you've got and the technical solutions though, so you can break down what requirements you need at each level, you need to accommodate input from um, external standards, EEC directives, all sorts of things that need to be taken account of. Um, also, there's other source information out there, studies that are, that are done through the life cycle that need to input and inform the requirements. Um, and there's also a number of things that are out there in terms of products that are used in construction, rail projects, whatever. It could be a driver interface and a cab. It could be a little device like a laptop that sits there, which is manufactured. And you could have the intention of specifying how that should be in terms of compliance to various standards and so on. Uh, trouble is, the manufacturer, manufacturer of these things will say, well, I'm not going to change things just because of your project. This is it, take it or leave it. So you have to accommodate de facto standards that are just out there because that's the way they've been built. So, so don't be frightened of this. This is actually um, an approach called, that, that I term requirements driven design. It uses something called rich traceability in here, which is an, a well known concept. But this is my particular take on it. Um, if you've got your stakeholder requirements, you can see this picture here. You have a single requirement there which actually results in three, in this case, three requirements uh, to the next level of detail. Because you're learning more about the system, you said it must, you know, the system must be safe. Okay, what does that mean? And you, you break that down into several requirements at the next level. You know, it must have protection systems, it must do this, must do that, and so on. Um, the thing that's sat between the two levels of requirements are satisfaction arguments and they're effect effectively your justification for allowing this to be a requirement and this one and this one. So you've got to give some sort of justification which says these three requirements replace that requirement at this level of detail but they don't change the scope of what this one says. They're just more detail about the same sort of requirement. Okay? And as you flow down to get to a level where you can actually start the designs, and typically in a big project, the designs live in a document management system. So document and don doc systems like that. They can still live there because you don't want multiple instances of documents. You actually want to maintain one instance of the master document. So if you're actually getting to the stage where you have those designs for every single requirement at this level of the, at this part of the life cycle, you link it to an individual element of design in a, de, in a design document and you create a design verification argument. So that says, I've done this bit of design to meet that requirement and these are the reasons why I've chosen to do it this way. Okay? And you have the traceability back up here. This could, to get from here to here, could be a URL to the document management system to actually click on the link and it gets you in there. Similarly, with the source document that's out there that you're considering different legislation, etc., you can create compliance arguments, very similar structures, which say how the piece of information there requires that there's a requirement here so that you can comply with that legislation or whatever. So you see you've got various structures for linking external information into the main flow of requirements. Oops, sorry. So, just bear in mind the structure you just saw. Um, that requirements different design structure addresses those three questions. You have a set of requirements which takes care of the what's. You have complete traceability through to the designs which tells you the how. And you also have um, the verification in the various verification argument structures. Okay. Um, I, my particular experience is using IBM doors. It used to be called Telelogic doors. And that's 
in use on many large projects. It's actually a database specifically for requirements. Um, the structures, the, the logical structure I just showed you before, isn't built indoors. You have to build it. So that's not really that difficult to do. <coughs> it's designed to help you do that. But what it does mean is you've got the freedom to build anything you like. It's as good as your own imagination. So what I'm trying to encourage you to do is say, think about the problem. and cr You've got tools, but don't just use them simply. Sim simply, you know, simplicity in the way you use them. Actually think about what you actually need to solve the problem and create your own structures. So what we saw was a way of going down that, if you like, that pyramid or triangle of requirements, linking into external things from, you know, via compliance arguments, linking this way by satisfaction arguments and across to designs in, a, in um, a, a document management system so that the, that level of design flows down to that one and down to this one in more detail and you, each one links across in turn to the individual requirements. Okay. Just, I'll, sh I'll only sh illustrate this by showing one of these types of structures. Effectively, indoors, um, sorry, you have modules, the term modules, where you can keep information. So you may choose to call this a requirements module and this is say a set of requirements at one particular level. This, these are requirements at the next level down. And if you say, okay this, this row in here is like a database row where you've got attributes. It could be requirements um, identification number, it could be something about where that requirement applies, the geography, the type of requirement and so on. You've got that information in there and that's your higher level requirement. And this actually, in the, again in the example, it show, shows three lower level requirements at this level. This one, this one and this one, which are linked via the satisfaction arguments which are stored in a separate module. But you can define the path from that one has to go through this module, has to go through that one indoors. So it guards against linking to the wrong thing. So basically, these are your lower level requirements and here's your traceability through the verification argument that says why these requirements are necessary at this level and how they replace this one at the next level of detail. And there are similar sorts of structures you can build for compliance argument, the verification arguments that link to your design and so on. And there's just, um, it's like a sort of explorer view indoors. This one is about contaminated land and the sorts of measures you can take here. It says, um, Basically, um, you need to minimise any possibility of the risk of contaminating or using contaminants on, on, the, on the land. And these are lower level requirements. So, well, okay, let's take that and think about how we can do that. You know, what, what more detailed requirements to avoid this happening we can do at this level. And this is a satisfaction argument which explains why these three actually replace that one and how they do it. So it's giving you very valuable information. Should there be any problems, you can always refer back to that. And that's giving you all your verification proof as you go along. And there's a couple, you know, several other screens. So um, these are some links through to the designs. Um, these are showing you different drop-down boxes or combo boxes you can define in the modules to put different types of tests in, in this case. When you think about the requirement, you need to think in advance how you're going to test it. If it's a real requirement, it should be testable. So you can put information in at that stage, and so on. So this is just to show an example the sort of screens. And um, really, when you get to the level of design, the process occurs in, in this, I, I do it in two iterations. You um, define your requirements, so you've got your elicitation and capture, talking to stakeholders, looking at source information and so on, um, analysing the requirements, are they good requirements, are they well structured, are they at the right level, are they uh, atomic, you know, they, do they stand alone basically, and so on. Various reviews, looking at the verification arguments, then baseline your set of requirements. So by that time, you're happy that you've got a good set of requirements and only then do you actually create the designs and link the design, this individual elements of design to individual requirements in that baseline. Uh, so you conduct your design 
and design verification argument reviews to make sure that that binding is in there. So, is this okay? Am I, anyone got any questions so far? No? No? Okay. Well, I mean, I use those structures on um, the central section in Crossrail, some of those structures, East London Line, and so on, large rail projects. But it seems like it's applicable to something that's very well regulated. Like <coughs> I'll be covering that later. I'll, I'll be going to, it, it is, and I'll be going there towards the end, so if you bear with me. Yeah. Um, so, basically, um, when you're conducting the review, you need to look out for a number of things. Um, well, I said that on these large projects you tend to have multidisciplinary t teams. So an individual team in a particular specialist area will create their own set of requirements. And you need to check, um, what is, is it a good requirement, as I've said earlier, unambiguous, verifiable, necessary, achievable? Is it feasible to actually implement something that meets that requirement in a design? Is it traceable? Is it the right level? Is it well formed? Um, is it testable? What's the test method? So basically when you're creating the attributes of the requirement, the actual information that accompanies the requirement in the requirements module, you, know, you might you have test method. Are there any assumptions um, linked to this requirement? You can create a requirement and you can say, I think you know, that this tunnel should be um, such and such height and so on. And then there'll be some analysis that may go on to actually do what they call the swept envelope. If a train goes through a tunnel in the underground, it moves around. So you need to make sure that the swept envelope, the actual biggest dimension when it wobbles around, doesn't hit the sides of the tunnel, otherwise you've got problems. So you may put some dimensions and you say, well, I think it's going to be that. When you've done your modeling, you may have got that assumption wrong. So initially, um, you raise a risk that it might not actually be okay, or you're waiting, you're waiting for information rather, rather than a risk, you might say, well, okay, we need to do the modelling. So, um, an RFI is raised, can you do some modelling for me to check out the swept envelope? Um, I need that information. When you actually get the information back, you may have found you got your, the assumption was wrong when you actually specified the requirement, so you change it. So that's all part of the process of qualifying the requirement and getting it right. Um, so, I said we review the requirements of the individual team. It doesn't stop there. Um, you have your disciplinary um, reviews. When you're doing your requirements and you're doing a particular level that's linked to the higher level, remember you've got to do your satisfaction arguments for, for groups of requirements to say why they replace the higher level requirement and so on. So, when a particular team, that's the, using the term a discipline team, like it could be the tunnel team or the communications team, whatever, that discipline reviews its requirements and it also reviews its satisfaction arguments. When it's happy that it's got the best set of requirements it can possibly produce, then it goes for interdiscipline reviews. It, the neighbouring teams also have a look and say, well, hang on a minute, this particular requirement here, you can't do that because you're affecting us. So both sides need to look at it and agree what is an acceptable requirement for the first discipline team or whether they have to change it to something entirely different because of the knock-on effect it's having on them. So you get those sorts of problems out of the way there. Then you go for promoter review, the client has a look at it and says, yeah, okay, or I'm not happy, I want you to do it this way, uh, but has a look at it and puts his comments in. Um, in that review and then it goes to wider review with the stakeholders so all the associated parties could be utility companies if it's a rail project and you talk about a surface rail requirement it may be on the boundary where it starts going underground so there may be some interface problems or that need sorting out about how the signaling takes over and so on between this, the surface rail and the underground so again that, those sorts of problems solved there when everybody is totally happy and signed up to it, then you baseline the requirements and then you start creating the designs and only then. And ultimately you do your discipline reviews of the design, interdiscipline reviews and so on. And in those cases you also look at the design verification arguments within the discipline team. And when, when you're happy about those, then you look at the requirements in general with a wider audience. Okay. 
Oops, sorry. Um, when you're, I spoke about requirements, requirements, manager being in the role and so on. It's important that the requirements management process doesn't act in isolation. <coughs> requirements managers should liaise with other managers in other key process areas. Um, so, um, me, well, it's important the require the liaise with um, people like the risk manager, person in charge of change control, and so on. Remember, it's a big project. You, as individuals, uh, I'm talking to the sort of postgrads here. When you actually start doing project management, you may manage complete projects on your own, or you may be part of a contractor's management team working on a portion of a large project. So you might not be the overall project manager there, but you may be taking on one of these roles. You may be doing the risk management. You may be doing technical assurance and so on. All, all necessary, but you might not be managing an entire project, but you could find yourself in one of these roles. So, um, as I said, you need to liaise with these people, the risk manager and change control and so on, um, and determine what data you need to capture. I mentioned about the attributes with the requirements, the data that goes associated. We spoke about the requirements, identify a name for that particular, a name and number for that particular requirement. One of the other things that's useful to capture is if you realise there's a risk associated with that particular requirement, and you put a risk ID, you, you raise the risk, put it in the risk register at a risk meeting, and the risk register creates its own number for that risk ID, and you put that risk ID number in the requirements, um, in, in the requirements risk attribute, so you know which risk in the risk register is associated with that requirement. I'll show you a benefit that you can get if you do that sort of integration. Uh, and similar with other processes. So the whole set of managed processes begin to become in integrated. Um, you need to work out the structures, how you're going to organise requirement, and say completely work out the attributes. So you need to develop a schema first of all, and how you're going to populate the modules and so on. So these are some of the key processes. We've mentioned risk. We said you may also have issues resulting from risk if something goes a bit pear-shaped creates an issue and you need to manage that. Um, legal processes, change control and so on. So this is one way that I tend to use just using Mind Manager to document, you won't see the detail but I say that the, the presentation will be available to you um, subsequently. Um, basically these are the various <coughs> types of activities that can happen in a, in a risk process. So this was on a particular rail project. Um, but it makes it easier for people to see. You also can have the risk process documented textually and hang it off a hyperlink off one of these boxes so they can actually look at the text if they want to. Um, so for each risk, you tend to... I mean, people have their own different ways of doing it on different projects, but typically describe the risk, the probability of it happening, the impact if it happens and so on, date it was raised, who owns it, and they tend to use quite commonly the red, red, amber, green is, you know, if it's green you've not got a problem at the moment, if it's red you need to start looking at your contingency to mitigate against the risk and so on, um, who's, who's actually got the action on to sort it out and so on. Um, so, uh, I've already spoken about the assumptions management um, but if we found the assumption proves was incorrect, um, you, you need to change the requirement it might, or it might not be able to implement it as you thought it could be, so you need to think about changing it. Um, or the design might need a modification to the requirement because for practical reasons maybe you can implement it if the requirement was slightly different but you need to obviously get that reviewed and see whether it can be managed within the project otherwise the, re the requirement, the permission to change the requirement if it's been baselined will need permission from um, one of the sort of project review boards to actually give that permission. Um, so in order to make those changes you need a change control process um, where you've got changes to design and or requirements um, 
as I say, you can manage it perhaps within the project team or it does actually go to the review board to change it. And again, other supporting process for change control. Um, you'll see it when you ultimately get the presentation. Uh, I know you can't see the detail. Um, but what, what it actually gives you is this. Um, here is a V model. Um, the project life cycle going on there. And as you go from advanced design to detailed design, as you progress through the project, your requirements go into more and more detail, linked by satisfaction arguments, linking across to design verification arguments, um, but being supported by various processes, technical assurance, interface management, document management, change control, configuration management, and so on. In this case, we're looking at the reviews within the technical assurance um, box of processes. Um, so we've got um, processes for doing the satisfaction argument review, requirements review, design verification arguments, and design reviews, all part of the supporting processes. Um, I mentioned that we it's quite common to use red, amber, green to manage risks. So um, if something has a very high probability and very high impact if it were to happen, then you'll find it's going to be in that area as a red risk. Um, something which is green, very low probability in terms of impact and uh, probability, sorry, very low score in terms of impact and probability, it's going to be green. So, um, if, that, if you find, if you're actually entering a new risk in the risk register, you can check if any of the requirements already captured in the modules um, are related to that risk, are impacted by that risk. If so, update the risk ID to the one you've just created in the risk register. Um, or when you create the requirement, as I've said before, you can put create the risk and put it in the risk registry. So, but you've, what you've actually got is, that, as I said, the ID in two places and it gives you that linkage between the requirement and the risk. So one of the benefits of that integration is that you can use it to your advantage. Um, typically, in very large projects, before you actually let the contracts out to the various contractors, um, the project team, uh, because you want to make the actual um, ITT, invitation to tender, attractive for people to actually take it on and send proposals. They need to be sure that there are no major risks sort of lurking in that uh, <coughs> ITT. So um, the project team typically tries to de-risk certain areas where they think there, are, there may be risks by getting um, various uh, you know, design uh, permissions, get, get pr uh, approval in principle for perhaps building in certain places and so on. So because you've actually linked these red risks, you've got your risk register there, create a risk ID, it becomes, you realise it's a red one. So within the set of all risks of red, green, amber, those red ones, you've got link, linked to particular requirements. You can actually use that to your advantage because if you know specifically which requirements are associated with your red risks, you don't have to widen the scope of your early design. You can concentrate on just those requirements that are affected by your red risk. And that, that actually reduces your design effort uh, before you go out to tender. So that's just one of the benefits you can get by tight integration. Um, We've really been looking at these sort of flow down of the main technical type of requirements and so on. We also have other requirements, legal requirements, environmental requirements, safety requirements. Um, I'll be talking a little bit later about standards, uh, particularly 15288, which is an, an international system standard. And that has processes in for um, making contracts between acquirers and um, suppliers, your client and the supplier. And they could be resulting from, there will be legal contracts. If you're doing, say like Crossrail, um, has to create an, a hybrid bill, they have to go out to the public, various stakeholders and get their input on any complaints, etc. Um, I don't want you to build in front of my house or at least within 200 yards. There may be agreement with that and a legal uh, contract is drawn up. 
So you need to actually capture those. If they sit in the lawyer's office, nothing will happen. So you need to make sure that those requirements, uh, the implication of that requirement in terms of what happens to prevent that, um, okay, when you build, all the rest of the um, buildings are in a certain place, but this particular, for Fred Smith, he doesn't want it there, so there's an exception condition. So when I said before, you're going generic in the way you build, these raise exceptions to that, but you need to take account of them. So you need to flow down the implications of the contract into requirements that actually will take account of those legal requirements and then turn those into design requirements to say, well, okay, what are you going to do about it? This is how are you going, how are you going to actually sort out those requirements? This is what's required here, and this is how you sort it out. But this, by actually binding those in, by creating those requirements and linking it into the main structure, you can take account of them. Um, again, it looks a bit complicated, but what I'm trying to show here is you've got your flow down of requirements here. And as you go up this side of your V model, you're actually starting with unit tests, um, um, subsystem tests, integration tests, and system tests, etc. You do your peer-to-peer -peer testing. As you've gone down into more detail, into systems and subsystems, again, you test across at that level. So taking one level here at the, the higher level, you can actually have system test requirements that you can create that, te that describe what you need to do to make sure that these requirements here that you did on the way down the V, the v model are satisfied. Um, so basically, based on those system test requirements, you can create test scripts, conduct your test, create your test results, and then link those to your test verification arguments, which say that these test results actually um, prove that those requirements have been met. So you're going full circle. Um, I think I'll just check the next slide. Um, okay, sorry, I'll go. Um, what we have here are when you've actually built your system and you've validated it with your various tests. You've got your verification as you go through and then you say, is the system we've built the system that was wanted effectively at that level? Um, then you go into your operational rollout. So you've got operational requirements which you should have been thinking about when you're doing all this stuff, but you capture them and you're actually running with those. So it's um, timetabling, all sorts of things if it's a rail system. Um, how are you going to sort of run the actual service and all sorts of things. Um, maintenance and support requirements. How are you going to do um, condition monitoring of the various devices, etc. And ultimately, into disposal requirements. Um, you also need to have key performance indicators, KPIs, to make sure that the system is actually the, main the support and maintenance and the various systems or subsystems are working as they're supposed to do. So you, moni you monitor those and you produce um, periodically um, KPI reports uh, from the KPI data. Think about the KPIs is that you, again you need to think about those what you need up here it's no use designing a system and then saying right how are we going to monitor this you need to be thinking about those things here because you may need to have specialist devices that you need to design as well and ways of data capture and you also need to periodically monitor these because you do them to, um, to um, fall within existing legislation but that could change so you may need to monitor them annually or every two years, whatever. Okay. Do you have customer or stakeholder bio? Sorry? The declaration of design performance. Do you have customer bio of the systems to make sure it meets their specifications? Um, well, effectively, that's your very... Are you talking about making sure the system is what was wanted? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that was the one I was saying here. If you're validating at the very top level... Um, sorry. Um, this, if you say this is the top level or even a level above that, the stakeholders' requirements, if those are the formalisation of the initial requ client's requirement, the one I said there was a, a wish list perhaps, yeah. and you've agreed what the formalisation is, 
if you do that validation at that level, say, well, that's the built system, that's the as-built system. So I don't know how many of you from sort of construction background, but when you're doing your various designs and so on, as you go through the um, various stages of construction, you create form A's and form B's and so on. These are sort of specialist reports for designs and so on. And then eventually, you, come, you, you actually have the as-built system and you actually need to validate the as-built system with these test scripts and conduct your tests and so on to say that when you go across peer-to-peer -peer here they've got what they wanted. Okay, does that, does that answer it? Yeah. It, it does, yeah, you're more or less testing the system like it's all requirements. Yes, the at the highest level. level. Yeah, before you go operational. Yeah. So you'll have created some criteria for system acceptance. You'll do your equivalent of FATS, factory acceptance tests and SATs, the site acceptance test and various other tests. You go through all that rigour as well. I mean, uh, I'm trying to show, I mean, it's beginning to look a bit complex there, but I'm trying to show this at a high level. Clearly, there's masses of stuff below here, but this is just the general principles of um, how, how to do it, basically. So, um, mechanics-driven design, these are some of the benefits. Um, basically, you evolve the design from the stakeholder requirements so that the design uh, the design brief will be clear each time you don't start your design until you've got a signed off set of requirements that everybody's had a chance to input to. Um, that means that large teams of engineers won't be tied into the design phase for extended periods. It'll be very clear what they need to do. They'll link each requirement to a specific bit of the design. Um, you've got full traceability, audible traceability. Um, the stakeholders and the, the client and the various stakeholders will have visibility of the requirement, which means they can see what's being proposed and they've got a chance to say, no, I don't want that, very early on before they sign off to it. So they get very clear visibility. Um, you get project-wide visibility because you're using formal natural language. If it's in England, you're using English formal statements, unambiguous statements. You're not using specialist gobbledygook um, you know, that nobody understands, you know, you know some, some detailed comms protocols. You're stating in natural language what this is going to, what, what's actually required, so everybody can understand it. And the verification you get at each stage contributes to the overall safety case if it's a regulated industry. Um, and these are some of the projects where that type of approach has been used, um, <coughs> Crossrail, East Online and so on. Um, Moving into international standards, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll try to move fairly quickly. Um, this is 15288, which is an international systems standard. So it has processes for creating contracts, agreement processes, acquisition process, supply process, uh, project enabling process, you know, sorting out your life cycle, all the infrastructure processes and so on. Um, the actual detailed project processes, planning, um, project control, decision management, risk management and so on, and then the technical process, the requirements analysis, architectural design and so on. So it, again, caters for all the different aspects of a project. There's a companion process, which is a software process, 12207. Similar, similar sorts of things, technical process and so on. Um, but within the actual what's called clause 6 of the implementation process in um, 15 to 8, 8, when you're actually building software to go in your system, these things sit inside that, that box. So very much the same format. So we've got our V model, or if you like, your engineering life cycle, and mapped around that life cycle are your 15 to 8, 8 processes yeah. project processes and so on and within the implementation you've got your software processes as well and you've got your reviews taking place so the whole thing although it's been quite complex because you, you're structuring it and managing those structures it becomes manageable so we can take we can say well okay if you like conceptually that's what the um, quality 15 to 8, 8 life cycle looks like. It's another V model. We might have a safety case life cycle if it's a regulated industry, say for nuclear. 
um, stop your safety requirements, um, look at the various options, go for a single option for the overall approach, um, produce a preliminary safety report, pre-construction report and so on. Um, again, that's a, lot, that's a view model life cycle. And you've got the general engineering life cycle, which everyone has their own take on, but broadly speaking, it's a system procurement, requirements definition, higher level design, detailed design and so on, and going up testing, as I've shown before. So, you end up with a situation like that. You have, these are only three, you may have many more effectively running together. You may have some other V models spinning off there and a subcontractor from the main engineering life cycle you might get somebody to do something specific and deliver back there when you're starting to integrate the system together. So that's what it starts to look like. You've got your quality, conformance to the quality life cycle, some regulated life cycle and your engineering life cycle. You may have somebody say prepare a tra tra you know, a training package for train drivers. Um, so when you get down to the requirements definition it says we need to have some training, you fire off that project and it delivers back there when you're doing the implementation. So before you go into operational rollout and testing. Um, how do you actually manage that complexity of all those life cycles? Well, remember I mentioned about the compliance argument, stuff that's out there, standards, um, international regulations and so on. You can actually use the compliance arguments to say, to take those, diff those exter effectively external requirements and merge them into the main engineering life cycle um, at various stages of the development where appropriate. So typically when you manage a large project, you use what are called gateways, where decisions about the, whether the project is in good shape, whether all the deliverables at that stage have been met and so on. And you have to go through the gateway when everything's in place and reviewed. So you can actually converge all the life cycles to common gateways onto the engineering life cycle via the compliance arguments. Um, and each compliance argument links to the clause in the standard or the external document that if that causes the requirement to be made. So if it's 15288, it'll link to that clause in that standard at that point in the life cycle. And the, the argument will say why you've had to do that. Okay. So let's take, as an example, um, a nuclear safety case and the typical sorts of uh, build up to the overall safety case. So you get different parts of the life cycle. Remember, this is going in a V, coming down here and then up the V. But it's shown obviously sequential here. So you've got preliminary safety case, um, post-operational safety case and so on. Various um, evidence that you've got to show the regulator for that industry that your system is safe and has been actually uh, constructed <coughs> according to proper best practice. So what you can actually notice um, when you look at, this is um, some of the high level requirements um, for nuclear power plant um, safety case consideration, the pre inactive commissioning safety case as an example, to demonstrate that the plant as built meets the relevant safety criteria and is capable of safe operation, to prove as far as practicable all safety claims, to confirm as practicable as far as practicable all safety assumptions and confirm, uh, etc. You notice there are a number of verbs there. So again, you can say, well, a verb says we have to do something to actually build up the safety case. So, if we think about the requirements-driven design, uh, we've already looked at a generic sort of methodology supporting the vertical traceability through the requirements hierarchy and links to the design and so on. The safety cases need to access verification evidence in specific prescribed ways at each stage of the safety case life cycle. So they're not generic in that sense. They've got particular obligations for the regulator for that industry. Uh, but the verbs in the safety case purpose statements are generic in the nature of what they 
require, prove, demonstrate. So you can say, well, okay, that calls for a certain type of evidence. Um, so we can use what I call generic subscript schemas corresponding to each type of verb alongside the requirements driven design generic structures and I'll show you what I, what I mean. Um, within the doors modules you may capture the requirements and the attributes so in order to get a textual report out you may say well this particular line the information here is, is a header in a written report that can be produced by say the doors database system or any other sort of requirements management system. Um, this could be uh, some text, it could be a note or something like that. This is another header in the document. This is a requirement within the document and it's of a type demonstrate. You could have another one of type prove to do with the specific pot of requirements, in this case to do with the safety case. So it's an additional one to the normal technical ones. So what this is showing is so we take the early design stage and we've got your early design requirements linked through your design verification arguments to your document management system with the design reports as before. You've got your, um, your satisfaction argument linking down to the next stage as before. But you've also got a pot of requirements in another module which are specifically to do with the regulation, regulatory requirements of that industry. So you could call those your safety, preliminary safety case requirements if you're at that stage of the design for that report. So a couple of the verbs in what was required by the regulator at that level were uh, demonstrate, prove. Okay. So you can actually create generic structures which say, well, if we're demonstrating, we have to have some sort of validation methods within a module we can keep a whole um, host of them depending what what aspect of the system we need to validate and then that particular type of validation says well we need various tests to create that validation so I have a test management module and we say well we want to do this specific test put your test methods in here uh, and then your test script run your test and create your test re results uh, to provide the verific verification evidence for that aspect that particular aspect of that demonstrate module. Similarly, you can say, well, there's a proof module. We need some proof methods, safety analysis to do with the various types of proof, different techniques to use a particular one. And then within that particular range of techniques, pick this one to do your analysis. It could be some sort of modeling or whatever. Um, produce your results and they again go towards your verification evidence. So that's one way you can actually bring structure to something like nuclear safety case rather than a whole pile of documents that you say well here's you know, go and read them somebody way through and you can actually go through your requirements and see how each one's being addressed and if anything were to go wrong you've got all the evidence as to why you did things the way you did them um, so again here's the various safety cases in a particular geographic area say it's a nuclear power plant uh, one bit of the geography is here and other bits over here doing similar things. So you've got these various structures, different ones, to do with the generic nature of the regulated require, regulatory requirements, leading to um, plant the, the, the geography if you designate that area one safety case, area N, you may have a number of them, all under the umbrella of the site-wide safety case. So they can link up and you can build up the whole safety case. Um, okay, um, life sciences, pharmaceuticals, again you can do a similar thing, um, pharmaceutical industries invariably have to comply with the um, FDA regulations, the US Food and Drugs Administration, so they look about the compliance of a single project, um, look at the way the design was done, and so on, um, very slob tests whatever, I won't go into it in the same detail, but you can see that that's actually a waterfall model. And um, as you go through the various um, testing, um, looking at preclinical testing and what is proposed for human testing, small tests of about 20 to 80 people, leading to several thousand people, etc. different sorts of studies, different sorts of generic types of obligations with the different types of techniques you need to use so you can actually
pre-build those structures and populate them for your specific project. So, um, how do you manage these projects when you're actually, you know, even, even pharmaceuticals, they quite often contract parts of the testing to be done by subcontractors and so on. Uh, large rail, nuclear projects have specialist contractors do different aspects. So, there's your overall V model. And from your system requirements, you can create a number of subsystem requirements that you can put in invitation to tender documents and award the contracts to your contractor who could then hook under those requirements, if you like, they're read only, they can't change them, but they can actually create their own mini-V model to take those requirements and deliver back there. So subcontractor one does that, subcontractor N does those, and they both deliver back to when the whole system has been implemented and put back together. So um, DOORS can support the management in this case. I'm talking about DOORS. I'm, I'm really trying to, because that's what I'm ma mainly familiar with. You can use spreadsheets. You can use other database systems. Spreadsheets have the limitations because it's two-dimensional. So you can have a flow down of requirement. But if you find that a particular low-level requirement can have multiple uses, then you get a few problems. You need to replicate the requirement or you need to change it in some ways. So the requirements databases are much better at handling sort of networks as opposed to two-dimensional binary trees or, or tree structures. Um, but basically, um, a good requirements database, um, can, the requirements can be allocated out to contractors, um, sets can be linked to the project teams and, and requirements implemented via the satisfaction arguments. Contractors can be given read access to the project team's requirements and develop their own. Um, and when they're implemented, um, the requirements can be reviewed by the client at a distance. And the completed subsystem can be integrated into the overall system. So the important thing that's often missed is that even when you get contractors doing the different things, even doing them correctly, then they deliver the requirements back and that's the end of the story. The bit that's missing is that even though a particular contractor or subcontractor can do the discipline team reviews, interdisciplinary reviews, stakeholder reviews and so on, <coughs> what you really need to be doing is intercontractor reviews of those requirements. Again, to look at side effects between contracts. And that, that's a step that's often missed. So, um, again, um, we talk about delivering business benefits. We talk about the client's requirements. They usually flow from an organisational's objectives and business requirements. So, um, you really, when they're doing the business plan, you need to establish the desired benefits and the stakeholder requirements and so on. But you need to check as the project goes along that those benefits are still being met. So it's all very well um, running the project, but certain external risks occur. You need to be talking to the right people to give the right information at the right time. So um, requirements-driven design isn't, alone isn't sufficient because of these external events that may happen. So you need the key decision makers to be informed in a timely way. So to provide that, it requires integration of the project and program management processes and the risk management and the change control and the attendance of key people at reviews. And I'll just show you very briefly, I won't go into detail in this, but you've probably all done this in sort of project management theory and practitioners will be familiar with this. But if you look at the organisation, you'll invariably have a sponsoring group with the senior managers and a senior responsible owner reporting in uh, to this level. So your individual projects have a project manager which reports to the program board and senior responsible owner reports up in each case. So you can have multiple programs, multiple projects and so on. Um, the important thing to realise is that, um, well, a couple of definitions, just to say who the key people are. Um, you need to get the information flow right. So if you're managing your project down here, if you can manage risks that go red within the project, fine. But if they're really severe risks, 
you need to report upwards into the program level and then if that's if there are an individual risk for a particular project or multiple risks combining across several projects occur that needs to be fed up um, as a potential change to requirements up to the um, sponsoring group ultimately by the senior responsible owner but there needs to be another path down which say well something's happened externally share price has gone down we can't keep this project going some other external event you've got to think about the paths down as well to say there's been a strategic change change to requirements therefore change to the program requirements what's the impact on the project and be able to change both ways so you need to be aware of project governance as well uh, very 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 quickly um, I don't know if you've heard of CMMI it's the capability maturity model for integration and it really uh, is a way of assessing um, a project's, uh, sorry, uh, an organisation's capability, how mature it is in its organisational processes. Um, so it has five levels. If you get into level two, you're actually doing pretty well as an organisation. Most organisations are not even at level two. But for a complex project uh, or a large programme, you need to have be really at level three as a minimum. So your processes are characterised by being proactive to development and develop them and they're tailored to the, uh, from the organization's standards. So the sorts of things you need to be maturing um, at level three are these sorts of things, um, <coughs> integrated project management, which is why I was talking about integration, um, organizational training, risk management and so on. You've also got other processes from level two, so you also need configuration management, um, project planning, various other things, um, requirements management, and so on. So you need all those things in place and working well in a proactive way. Um, we spe we've mentioned the use of requirements database like DOORS. That's only one of many tools. At that level of complexity, you need to rely on tools but not just blindly, you need to use tool, tools and be inventive about how you use them to your advantage. But if you think about, say that's doors and these are various other tools, then you've got that sort of connectivity such that one tool connects to the other N minus, N minus one tools. And for all the tools, you need to integrate for them all to work um, N times N minus one integrations for a particular version of the, of the tool or application. So each time an application changes, you need to change the, uh, the version interfaces to N minus one other applications. So one of the challenges is to actually integrate at the data level below here, um, so that if that tool changes, it's only that one version interface you change here and the rest stays the same. So it's building that sort of system <coughs> to minimise the disruption of version changes from um, suppliers of various tools. Um, so basically, just um, to summarise, um, described an approach which gives you a top-down decomposition of complexity into manageable sizes, um, giving you full traceability from the design back through the various layers of requirements <coughs> up to the user and stakeholder requirements and how you comply with external standards and so on how you incorporate verification evidence as an integral part of the mechanisms and how that process is supported by project processes which are well integrated okay. so basically the main principles are specify what you want in terms of requirement show how you will do it and provide the evidence. Okay. So you build the right thing in the right way, basically. So, um, I have also said it's not sufficient on its own. Um, you need robust governance structure. The core processes to operate at CMMI level three, the integration of key processes and sound delivery mechanisms to inform the key decision makers at the right time with the right information. 
and an adequate set of tools and applications to support the management of that complexity. Okay, um, there are some references to some articles that I've published if you're interested, but you can actually get those from the presentation. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there's time um, out of interest. Have we got time? No? Well, we need to be, okay. need to be out by eight. So I can give you two minutes. Um, take some questions as well. Yeah, I can take some. Well, yeah, take questions while this is running, if you like. Um, these are some of the other things you can do um, with those process maps in, say, Mind Manager. You can link the various maps together so you can navigate graphically around your processes via hyperlinks. And that's what this is showing. Um, click on the hyperlink, go through um, showing the various details at, at what's called the powers phase in this project. Um, it's going into the requirements process, showing issue management and various other things. Don't worry too much about the details. There was a, that box, um, sorry, uh, at the top here is how you can actually log in to the database from the mind map and open a session up there. So you've got information on there to tell you contextually, uh, context dependent information to say, okay, here's how you use an explorer window, here's how you log into doors, happy with that. Um, well, no, click on the box and get an audio visual presentation like this to explain it to you. Are you happy? Click on the box and log in and put some requirements in. So you can do things like that to actually make life easier for the engineers on the project. So anyway, what's that? So well, I think it will actually get to uh, actually an interesting bit, hopefully. Um, I'll try and move it on a bit. Um, no, all right. Um, there's something to do with uh, how you can actually link it down to the individual teams as well. So this is showing, will ultimately show um, going into some rail processes to, I mentioned <coughs> GRIP earlier, which is the Guide to Railway Investment Project, I think, which is its own life cycle for rail, uh, for network rail. I think there is somebody from Network Rail here tonight. Uh, but uh, they've got a V model, and you can actually go and make these generic processes linked to a specific team layout and look at the, de the design documents the team produces. So, obviously, do anything like right with the maps, and in this case, I did actually um, these are enhancements, and you'll see in a minute it actually goes into the uh, design somewhere over here. Uh, single single option design. Here are the various teams working on that design, and then it will click on this particular key team here. It says, well, okay, this is to do with structures and buildings, and these are the various drawings and designs hung on to that. So you can actually navigate around your processes, link into your specific team structure and look at what they've been doing and so on. And the, the beauty of this is this is integrated into the processes and the infrastructure to support the project. And what you can do is say, well, okay, we got, we've got a new project which is very similar to this. So you can clone the infrastructure of this project, including the requirements, and establish them in the new projects and change the types of document, the logos and the structures slightly and you take the generic requirements and you're up and running in perhaps two or three months as opposed to 12 to 18 months. So that, you know, that, that's the advantage of doing that. So, anyway, sorry about that, that was out of interest. What, the maps? Oh. Yeah. But it seems also quite time consuming that someone would have to go on the ball to make sure that you know we've got requirements in a certain place so they know where it is if something changes um, go back and make sure what, what I actually are you talking about the team members putting requirements in? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, the, the whole process is, 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 you can see how, how, how robust it all is, but it, it's, it's a, the management of it, if one person trying to manage that, the last that's an absolute nightmare. Well I've had to I've had to do that myself as a single requirements manager doing all that. Though a lot of those maps, um, I must be quite a nerd actually, because um, <laughs> in, in the time in the evening when I was working in London, sat in a hotel, I was generating those maps. Um, so...
Uh, no, the model's captured. Uh, that's. Well, if you only have enough to use it, I want to change that. What else could you use the model? Um, well, the, the, it's documented in a sense by the maps and by existing requirements, modules, and structures, so you can copy those. They're there. Uh, in terms of being able to put requirements in, say you've got um, multiple, multiple, multidisciplinary engineers, perhaps a dozen teams of them, or several hundred engineers, all with their own teams. Um, we've spoken about quite a lot about using doors, um, and it sounds expensive. You think, well, okay, doors licenses are expensive. In actual fact, from a practical consideration, it's not. Um, Think about Crossrail is, I think, last count about 16, 17 billion pounds. Um, you might have perhaps about 300 or so engineers, maybe more, um, divided into teams, perhaps about 10, so about 30 teams. Um, if they were all to use doors, for each of those 30 teams, the way I used to do it is, it, is designate one team member who particularly likes a little bit of IT, um, quite happy to learn some very simple rules about entering a requirement, logging into doors, entering a requirement, editing it, deleting it, and so on, linking it. Very simple. You can teach them probably in about an hour or so. Um, that person could enter requirements on behalf of the whole team, say half a day a week, doing his own engineering job the rest of the week, and then enter what requirements have been formulated on behalf of the other members. So, from a cost point of view, if you've got one team member for each of, say, 30 teams, um, I think the current price of a web-based license for doors, so they can actually interact, uh, it, sorry, interact with doors via a web browser, um, a five-user license is about 4,500. So if they actually had a timetable, um, perhaps a couple of afternoons a week per team, you could have five... <coughs> user licenses that can't be used simultaneously but you can timetable it to cover five teams and so if you've got 30 teams that's uh, six licenses and a five user license currently for doors is about four and a half thousand so you're talking about twenty seven thousand pounds perhaps another license for an administrator um, and perhaps you might have three or four reviewers so um, perhaps at another four and a half thousand, you just a little over thirty thousand on a project, which overall cost is about sixteen billion. You know, it's, it's not that much really. So it's quite. Again, you've got to think about it from practicalities and say, well, it doesn't mean for three hundred engineers you need three hundred individual licenses. You might need six five user licenses on a on a remote access license. So, and it's quite easy to teach them. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think I think uh, we're working. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I hope I have all this question. It's a great, robust process. Of gentlemen there said fantastically well explained in, in, in concise uh, overview. And um, one of the things you, you mentioned a lot of people miss is that interdisciplinary teams get together to make yeah. sure that all of these all parts do join up. How do you encourage that to happen? <laughs> you lock them in a the room for about three or four days and don't let them out till it's sorted, basically. <laughs> that was my approach. Um, it really is that rigorous. Let me give you an example. Um, I worked on East London Line and formulated a lot of this approach then. And over a period of about six months, we created something like about 4,000 requirements. And there were about 12 discipline teams. And I virtually had to set up the modules, teach them how to put requirements in and about writing good requirements. And then we had quite a rigorous set of reviews. And literally for one team, you could have a first review for two or three days, just get the whole team away from their office on the sort of project team site and say, right, we're, we're in this room for about three days and we're going to sort out things and go through every single requirement. So, yeah, that's okay. No, we can't have that. Need to tighten that one up, discuss how you can do it. And literally, it's very, very um, hard and it's very rigorous, but that's the only way you can do it because you get out what you put in. Because that's a control process, I can, I can see that. There's yeah. that other part <coughs> complement that. The, 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 the,
the, the teamwork and the behaviours that support controls. But you have to get the you have to get their line manager to buy into it, to get them to give the time to come off site and, and get into these reviews. And you have to get, as I said, you have to get senior management buy in to say, yeah, it's a bit of an act of faith in, in many senses because what you're saying is if you get the requirements right, you have less problems further along and any problems will show up sooner and they'll be cheaper to fix. That is a, a fundamental truth. <coughs> but you have to have faith that that will come out in the wash. The biggest thing that made people believe in my experience was um, when I first started using this stuff, um, <coughs> the biggest cynics were the engineers themselves because they thought, oh, here's some more bureaucracy. What, you know, what is this all about? We're, why are you telling us how to suck eggs? We've been doing this for years. And um, on East London line, they actually had an existing design which they'd done and thought was, was actually good design. So I said, well, okay, forget your design. Let's, we need to create some requirements for this level uh, in the, in the um, <coughs> life cycle. Let's go away and do the requirements from scratch. And that's what we did. And then we did a gap analysis between the design that they'd created, the original design that they created and the requirements that they'd created with guidance. And they thought, you know, is that a good set of requirements? Yeah, it's the best we can do. Right, let's do the gap analysis and see which requirements have corresponding design elements. And if you've done it right, they should all match. You should have a one-to-one -one correspondence. What we actually found was that there were quite a number of design elements that didn't match to any, any requirements. So they were superfluous. They designed things they didn't need to do. There were also a lot of design elements missing. So even though when they did it from scratch with the requirements, they could see the need for certain things, but they hadn't designed it, so there were parts of the design which were incomplete. And it's only then that they realised there was value in it, because they said, well, actually, you know, fair enough, we can see now why it's useful. But it took that exercise to actually get their buy-in too. <coughs> Anyone else? Um, yeah. On your beakers, you show um, basically this whole um, design, uh, requirement driven design. Where are you bringing in your contractors and your suppliers? Is that? That is. Um, that? Round about that level, yes. When you actually. Maybe I didn't get this very clear enough. On these big projects, you typically have a client project team, and they do a lot of the creation of the process infrastructure and also, in this case, um, <coughs> some of the requirements at the next level down from stakeholder create the system requirements and so on. And when, they <coughs> excuse me, when they're happy that that's actually been established and they've been thoroughly reviewed, everybody's happy that that is a thorough representation of the requirements of the system, they then start thinking about how that breaks down into subsystems and those different subsystems, well, they, they appoint a main contractor and then the subsystems are let out to the subcontractors and it's at that point in the left hand side of the V model broadly speaking halfway down before you get to implementation and so on when you actually develop the subsystems and then bring them back together for integration to building the, the overall system but you've, you've already placed the order with all of your contractors and suppliers before you got to that detailed design phase? Uh, only you, you've sort of given notice of it, but you've not let out those requirements yet. So you need to allow for that delay to actually get the ITT out and respond, which is why you do the design in principle to de-risk, ready for that phase of the life cycle, to actually let the contracts. I mean, the other big thing that tends to get missed, I mentioned about the cross-reviewing um, <coughs> of the contractors' subsystem requirements and so on, the other thing that tends to get missed is at the beginning of the whole process, when those contracts are being met, um, the sort of financial part of the organisation, the people who do contracts and so on, tend to have blinkered vision and quite often there isn't really, or there may be one or two technical people helping them. What they tend to do is let the contracts out to this contractor, another contractor, contractor this one and so on. <coughs> What they often fail to do, even on very big projects, 
is lay those contracts out side by side and look at the dependencies. Um, I mean, I can think of a project I worked on, and apart from working on the technical side, I also worked on the financial side to um, evaluate the claims from contractors, what they call variation orders. So if a contractor thinks they've been delayed, they claim some extra money, and it's looking at the principle of the claim, then looking at who's actually culpable, and then working out how much each one is going to get or not get, and so on. And um, I remember in one instance, it was a rail project. One contractor was responsible for the signalling system. The other contractor was responsible um, for the actual control system. In order to make the control system designed to see if it was feasible, they needed to have a simulator. So they wanted the site data for the signalling systems at a certain time point in a certain format. Because, and they'd said that in their contract. The other contractor who was doing the signalling said they're going to live a year later than the first contractor wanted and in a different format. So there was a mismatch and that all had to be sorted out. And um, it's difficult when you get to that stage, unless you actually take care to lay the, the plans out and get that into your contract, that they'll, they'll actually cooperate at that time. So, yeah. okay, great. Yeah. Okay, Thank thanks you. very much. Um, can we just thank Steve once again? For, uh, Thank you.